Hello Haskellings, let's get straight into it. Day 20. And we've got to put together a bunch of tiles into a big picture. So let's get our input and we'll have a quick look at it. So we have a bunch of 10 by 10 tiles and there was 1728 lines in that file which means we have 12 by 12, 10 by 10 tiles. I'm using interact G again to separate out the blank space delimited tiles from the input file and we get back exactly those tiles. I'd first like to extract out the tile numbers and convert the tiles to lists of Boolean values. Similar to what we've done before, we can get the first line of each of these input strings by using pattern matching. So T here will be that first line of each of those tiles. We can use words to split on the space in between and grab out the second word, which will be the number followed by a colon. We can then use init to get rid of the colon and read in the resulting integer. As we've done before, we can map a map of equals equals hash to get our list of list of bools. So let's try and get our list of tiles by mapping over our input. And we have a bug because that should be list of list of bool there, of course. Okay, let's have a look at those tiles to see what it looks like. I wasn't expecting that, so let's have a quick look at the input file again. And I see, yeah, there's a blank line at the end, so that means we'll end up with an empty group. So let's filter out the empty groups and see how that looks. And yeah, that looks a lot better. We're going to be comparing these tile edges together, so I'm going to make a convenient way to do that. And I'm going to create a function that can convert an edge, which is a list of bools, to an integer. And we do this in the same way as we've done before when we converted the binary strings to integers. Except this time, instead of using digit to int, we use bool01 to convert the boolean to a 0 or a 1. I'm going to just grab out the first tile as a test tile to work with. I'd like to test out the bools to int function, so I'm going to grab the grid with second and then use head to get the top edge of the grid to run bools to int on. And that looks like it's working. Now I'd like some way to represent a tile orientation, so I'll create a data type for that with a value for whether it's flipped or not and then the number of rotations. Next, I'll create a list of all the possible orientations using a list comprehension. The number of rotations should be between 0 and 3, and it represents the number of 90 degree rotations. We should then make a function that can actually perform an orientation on a tile. If the boolean value is false, then we simply rotate by n. However, if it's true, then we can arbitrarily decide whether to flip first or after, as long as we stay consistent. Now, one way to do a rotation is to actually do a flip and then a transpose. I'm not sure if this is the fastest way, but it works. To rotate by n, we can simply use our apply n function on our rotation function. Putting this all together, we can make a function that's going to get all the possible orientations of a tile. So I have to pause for a second because I tried to add in the getOrients function with our test tile and I got an empty list error. And it took me ages to figure out that it was the advent of code module apply n function that couldn't deal with n being zero. Okay, so after fixing that, we can get back to where we were. And we have our list of integers, which is a flipped and non-flipped value for each of the four edges. I'm going to move this calculation down to the bottom here because I'd like to actually turn this into a function. I'm going to call it getInts and it's going to take in the full tile, including the tile number, and return us all of the edge values for that tile. Let's use our test tile again to test that and we should get back exactly the same result. Now I want to add the tuple number to this list so I can create a full mapping and I can use a tuple section to do that. However, we first need to add the language extension tuple sections for that syntax to work. And now we're ready to map that over all of our tiles so we can get back a list of all of the edge values with their corresponding tile number. We use concat map instead of map to put all those lists together into one big list. 
The next thing to do is try to find out which of the edges are unique. A common way to do that is use a combination of sort, group and filter. In this case we need to group on only the first part of the tuple. However, group on is in data list extra so we need to import that. And we need to actually install the package as well so let me just do that. OK, we're back. And now that we've grouped on the edge value, we can find which groups only have one member by doing a filter. We filter equals equals one dot length, which will test to see if the length of the list is equal to one. The list of lists we get back, we can map head over because they're all of length one, but we're only interested now in the tile number. So we can map second.head over that instead to get back the list of tile numbers pertaining to each of the unique edges. We can once again do the sort, group and filter trick to find out how many of the tiles have two unique edges, because those will be the corner tiles. But note that each edge is represented by two values, one its flipped value and one not. So we filter on a group length of four to pick out the tiles with two unique edges. Finally, we map head over those groups because every member of the group will be the same. And with that, we have the tile numbers of our four corner tiles, and all that remains is to multiply them together. And now it's time to check that answer. And that's a gold star. But here comes part two, which itself is in multiple parts. We're going to start by using our tile int mapping to create an actual map from the edge values to the tile numbers that contain them. Now because there's more than one tile for every edge value, we need to use from list with plus plus to create a list of tile numbers. Then we use map to convert our tile number into a singleton list of tile numbers ready to be appended together. We should be able to look at that resulting map once we've imported data.map. And indeed, it's interesting to note that there are no more than two tiles matching each of these edge values. This makes the problem of putting the tiles together into a big grid much simpler. We can start with any of the corner tiles, so let's just pick the first one. But we do still have the problem that we don't know what orientation that first tile should be in. So we need to get access to that orientation in this map here. But for that to work, we'll also need to add it to our getOrientations function. As that's now returning a list of tuples, our function for map also should take a tuple. We're going to continue to key off the value coming from bulls to int, so that should be first in the tuple that we return. The values in this mapping will consist of the orientation, the tile number, and the grid of the tile itself. And we're getting an error because we're taking the head of an empty list. So let me just check the corner tiles here. And indeed, because the value side of our mapping is now a tuple, the group and sort here doesn't work as we expected. But we still want to get that orientation out. So we can use sort on and group on and extract out the second element of the three tuple by making a little helper function that can do exactly that. So the corner tiles list now also contains the orientation and the complete grid of each of these tiles. We wanted to get the edges for one of the tiles at random, so we picked the first tile, but we're only getting one of the edges because in the first part, we mapped head against that corner tile list to pick out just one of them. Let's remove that now, and we should be left with the four orientations for this tile that gave us a unique value for the top edge. Two of those orientations should be flipped and two not, so let's filter out the flipped ones, which leaves us with the two orientations of the non-flipped edges. We can use this to determine the orientation of the starting tile assuming that it should be in the top left. But first, let's extract out the tile number from our starting tile, and we can do that using pattern matching. 
So we match the first element in that list, and then we extract out the second part of our three tuple. But now comes the hard part of actually determining the orientation of this starting tile. But I have an idea. Of these two orientations of our tile, one of the rotations should follow the other in numerical order mod 4, because one of them should represent the top edge and the other the left edge. So let's extract out just the number of rotations and the corresponding tile from each of these. We can then calculate which of the edges is the predecessor of the other to determine which one is the top edge and which is the left edge, because the top edge takes zero rotations and a left edge takes one rotation to get to the positions where we calculate their values. So we finally have the exact grid of how our top left starting tile should look. Next, I'd like to work out which tile comes below this one. We can do this by looking up in our tile map the value for the last row in our grid. Well, let's actually make this into a function on one of the pairs that represents our tile. But when we put our starting tile in to get below, we get back two tiles, one of which is the starting tile itself. So we need to filter that out of the resulting list. And we're getting an error here because tilemap is storing lists of three tuples. So we can use t2 of 3 to make sure we're indeed filtering on the tile number. But actually, we don't need the orientation in our tilemap anyway, so let's just remove it completely in this map. And now we can change the t2 of 3 back to a first. Now that we can get the tile below any other tile, we can use recursion to get the whole left hand column. So if we found a next tile, then we recur on that and add our current tile to the list. Otherwise, we just return a singleton of the current tile. This should give us a list of all of the tiles in the left hand column, in their correct orientation. In total, there are 144 tiles, so a starting column of length 12 makes sense. After giving this function a better name, we can write a function that gets our top row by getting the tiles to the right of the given one. We can do this by orienting our starting tile so that the right edge is on the bottom with this orientation command, and then calling below tiles on it. We need to then reorient those tiles so that their bottom edges are back on the right. We do that by inverting the orient command that we did before. It turns out to be the same because it's effectively a transpose operation. Upon testing, we also see that there are 12 tiles in the top row, which is what we expect. So getting the complete grid is now as simple as mapping right tiles over our left-hand column, which is below tiles of our starting tile. Let's now take a look at that in ASCII. So let's write a show map function, which is going to convert our list of list of bools into a list of list of characters. And we use map map again with the bool function to get back either a dot or a hash based on the Boolean value. We can then use unlines to join it all up with carriage returns. Now, because we have a list of list of tiles, we need to use map map show map to show them all. We still need to remove the borders from these tiles, but first let's give a name to our list of list of tiles. We'll need a function to remove the first and last elements of a list, so we'll call that mid. So let's map over all of our tiles, and on each of them we can remove the first and last row, and then on each row the first and last character. This leaves us with all the borderless tiles that we now need to sew together. We can do this by folding over each tile in a row and then using zip width plus plus to concatenate all of the individual rows together. Since the tiles in each row have been put together, we can now remove one of the maps in the call to show map. But we still have an error because that should be a call to foldal1 because we don't have an initial accumulator. Let's zoom out a little bit on that grid. And we still have yet to combine the rows together, so we use concat on that and remove another map from our show map. This is now our completed grid, and it's time now to start our search for monsters. 
We're going to need to grab the monster string from the website, so I'm going to put that into a list of strings called monster. I'm just going to use copy and paste to copy the literal string into our Haskell source file. Once that's done, I can convert it to a list of list of booleans with map map equals equals hash like we've done before. But I'd like to convert the signature of this string into some sort of integer. So I'm going to make a mcsig function that's going to take these three rows of 20 characters and convert that to a 64-bit int. It's going to use this same fold that we've seen a few times already now, but this time we're going to be folding over just the 20 by 3 grid. We're not just going to use this to get the signature of the monster, but we're also going to fetch the signature of every 20 by 3 area within our main grid in order to look for monsters. So the find monsters function is going to take in our complete grid and return us back the number of monsters found. We're going to use recursion, so the base case will be when the grid is empty, in which case we'll return 0. Also, if the number of rows left is less than 3, we want to stop checking there, so we also return 0. Otherwise, we can actually try and make the signature for this area and test that against the bits in the monster signature. When we do a bitwise AND against the monster signature and get back the monster signature, we have a hit. Either way, we use recursion to move one character along in the row. But if we had a hit, then we add one to that value before returning ourselves. However, if there aren't enough characters left in each row, then instead of going to the next character, we go to the next row. The problem is that in our recursive calls, we've actually removed the start of each line. So we make that a helper function that also takes in the rest of the full rows. We call that ss0. So we have to make the recursive calls also call find monsters prime, and remember to add the ss0 parameter. For this second recursive call, we're going to use ss0 prime, which is going to be the tail of ss0. That's going to move us to the next row. Now that that's done, we can actually try and find some monsters in our grid. And we're getting back a zero, but at least we're not getting back any errors. And of course, we're getting back a zero because we're only checking a single orientation of our completed grid. So let's test against all of the orientations of our input. We can duplicate the input coming in to find monsters prime by composing it with dupe and then calling uncurry on the function itself. However, we're going to map this over all of those orientations and get orients returns us a tuple, so we're going to call second on that. And indeed, for one of the orientations, we're getting back a value of 39. So let's run maximum on that to get back that maximum value. So it's finally time now to take our number of monsters, multiply that by how many true squares are in a monster, and subtract that from the number of true squares in our complete grid. And that should be our answer. So let's check that. And that's a well-earned gold star. Give yourselves a pat on the back. Well, until next time, Happy Haskelling!